Okay. So we welcome everyone uh, to the, our evening of both a Purim announcements and a message that I would like to share with the shul. You know, this Purim, like we've been saying through all the holidays, uh, is one that we've never experienced before. Uh, the truth of the matter is I looked at one of our original emails of, of last year dealing with Purim, and it spoke about the fact that we were going to be davening uh, for the containment of the virus. At that point in time, it had not really spread beyond New Rochelle. And we thought it would be limited there and really didn't realize the significance of the events that were going to happen and how much has changed and how much we have experienced as a community uh, between last Purim and this Purim. Uh, but we're not, I'm going to first deal with the announcements and to talk about the announcements. Everything that we speak about this evening, you don't have to take notes. It's going to be emailed out together with the recording. We're going to go over the directives, the directives to make people aware of what to expect if you're coming to shul, but also the directions and directives for people who are going to be home. Um, we're going to go through the Purim guidelines, as we call them, for 5781. So first off, we talk about Tanis Esther. Tomorrow is Tanis Esther. It's a fast that begins in the morning, uh, commemorating the fact, not the fact that, the, uh, that they fasted, that Esther fasted for three days before presenting herself to King Ahasuerus. It's, after, it's over the fact that they fasted on the day of the battle. And so because the day of the battle was prior to the day that they rested, the Purim is Yudalid, they fought on Yud Gimel, so we commemorate the fact that they fasted while they were in battle. So we have Tanis Esther. The fast begins at 522 in the morning and concludes at 623. Now, usually in a usual year when the fast concludes, which is at evening time, says at 623, in a regular year, one waits till after they had listened to the Megillah before they go ahead and they eat. Many people, as we're going to get to when we talk about Megillah Sesta, when we get to that section, many people will not have davened Marv or heard the Megillah when they reach 623 or even after 623. They will not be listening to the Megillah for that first shift, in which case Rav Herschel Shechter has Paskin, that a person is allowed to take a snack, not a meal. You wouldn't break your fast like a regular meal. You'll save that for after you hear the Megillah but a person can have a snack, breaking their fast, drinking, uh, giving them the ability that they're, it's not going to affect that they're not eating food is not going to affect them uh, negatively. We also have tomorrow, there'll be an availability as a Ramah brings down in Shulchan Aruch, that there's a custom of giving the Machsis HaShekel. The Machsis HaShekel is this idea that we know that we find Kal Yisrael had given during the month of Adar money, a half a shekel, we use three half a shekel. Someone told me actually um, they tried to find the half dollars. The Ramah brings down that based on the half a shekel, we use half of our denomination, whatever that denomination is in the, you know, in the, uh, in the land that a person lives. Here it's a dollar, so it would be a half a dollar. They told me they went to three banks to try and find half dollars for their outdoor minion, and they weren't able to find uh, and to procure half dollars. The fact that you don't have those half dollars does not um, inhibit a person from performing this particular mitzvah. It's brought down that prior kodem mincha, and a person could do this either at home or the shul that they're in. If they have the coins, uh, especially in the shul or an outdoor yard minion, you basically put down the money, at least $1.50 for the three half coins. You put that down, you lift up the coins. So by putting down the dollar fifty, you've acquired the coins, and then in putting that down, you're placing the coins, and you're giving the coins, and you're giving that that dollar fifty. If people are not comfortable holding the coins, they do not have to. They can simply go ahead and put in paper money. They don't have to ch touch anything. Uh, likewise, if a person is home and wants to perform the mitzvah of Machsa Shekel, they can do so as well. You don't have to be in the context of a minion. And before Mincha, you would set aside the money, and then that money subsequently is, uh, is, given, is given to Tzedakah. Now we turn to our attention to Megillas Esther. Now, Megillas Esther, um, one of the reasons why I'm recording this and we're going to send it out 
is because especially for those who are coming to shul, we're also going to deal with those who are at home. But for those who are coming to shul, tomorrow night is certainly going to be a challenge. And it's a challenge that I think we're able to uh, persevere with and succeed. But it's definitely going to be a challenge. The reason is, is that over the course of Purim, both at night and during the day, we have to have, because of our social distancing limitations of not being able to utilize the spaces as we normally would, where we're still pretty much six feet away from everybody, from all the seats, that limits us in our ability to have many people in a room at a time. We are therefore having 40 Megillah readings over Purim, 20 at night and 20 during the day. Tomorrow evening, tw over 1,250 shul members and family members will be attending one of those 20 minyanim. And on Purim morning, over 1,000 shul members, men and women, will be attending. The only way that we will be able to do this in a safe way is if everyone listens to the directions that we are going to give. Um, some of them are going to be quite practical. Practical number one is plan your trip. In terms of parking, the parking lot is not going to be available because we put up a large tent that's going to be utilized over Purim. Um, there's a wonderful youth event planned for Sunday that parents and grandparents can bring the children to. So parking is not gonna be available within the parking lot. Um, there's going to be, um, in terms of the, uh, the spaces, many different spaces are going to be used. Some people aren't familiar. They might have signed up for a college house minion, a high school house minion, a Nisuk Sfarad minion. If you're not familiar where those locations are, you will go and uh, so they come in a, with a little advanced time to find those locations. Uh, something that's important to note is the following. Because many of the men are not able to be at that 615 Mariv, so all the minyanim that start at 615 will start at Mariv, but also any minion that any Megillah reading that has men in it, even the 910 one will begin with Mariv to allow all the men to daven with Mariv. If there are Megillah readings as we have both in the night and the day that are identified as women's only, they will only start with Megillah reading. Uh, so certainly not to come late in thinking that they're going to be davening and you'll catch it. Now, there are the shachras minyanim that women have signed up to, as well as the 615 uh, minyanim that women have signed up with. Those are going to have marv and in the morning also, also are going to have, uh, also to have a shachras. Everyone attending, we've been socially distant and masked. So anyone coming into the building is going to have to wear a proper mask. If anyone has a Purim mask, they, they cannot have a full-faced Purim mask. We have to be able to ascertain that even the children are fully masked. That includes their mouth and their nose. Uh, Baruch Hashem, that's something that we've been very careful with at the shul throughout the entire year as we go through this. And it's something that we need to be careful with with regards to Purim as well. Another technical detail of tomorrow night is with regards to the entrances. So on Purim night, we'll be using both the parking lot entrance doors as well as the main lobby doors. Many of you are familiar with the security that goes even pre-COVID. We started only using exclusively one entrance. That's what many shuls and many schools uh, following the safety guidelines use only one entrance. Tomorrow we have extra security guards, both from Colorado, our security team, as well as our CSS team that's going to allow us to utilize both doors. So both doors, but it depends what menu you're in. If you're registered in a Joseph K. Miller main shul minion, you'll use the parking lot entrance doors, both to enter and to exit. If you're in any one of the other minyanim in the main building, so then you will, ideally we ask you to utilize the center lobby doors that exit and end onto Peninsula Boulevard. This will create a flow of traffic that hopefully will minimize the social contact of the different groups, especially tomorrow night. We have staggered minyanim. They don't all begin at 615. You have to look at your schedule. Some are 615, some are 630, some are 640, 715, 730, 740, 750. And depending on that schedule, we ask that you enter the appropriate door. 
and that will allow the staggering, will allow hopefully um, everything to be done, to be done in a, to be done in a safe way. Uh, inside, we go outside, our Sukkah Plaza is going to have four shifts. We have close to 300 shul members, male and female, who will be davening outside tomorrow night. The entrance, if you haven't been to our Sukkah Plaza, the entrance is on the far side by the cutout near the Glen Drive uh, cutout to exit onto Glen Drive. It is that exit and entrance that should be used to, uh, to enter into the Sukkah Plaza um, to the Sukkah Plaza area. And we know that there are many who unfortunately are still not able to come out to shul and are at home. And so what are the guidelines in terms of fulfillment of the mitzvah of Kriyas and Megillah for those who are at home? So the way that we have presented it in the guidelines, and again, it'll be out tomorrow, is that if you're not coming to shul, the next best thing is to lane from a kosher Megillah in your home. If you're not able to do that, or you're not, you don't have a Megillah, so the next best thing is to have someone come to your home and to be able to lane. It could be done in a safe way. They don't even have to come into your home. It's not to be, it doesn't necessarily have to be in the same space. It could be through a window that gets open. It could be through a porch door, whatever particularly would work. That is something that is also a possibility. Um, where many people have inquired, what about Zoom? Can we fulfill Kriyas HaMegillah through Zoom? And it gets a little confusing, especially for our shul and members of our shul, because we have been Zooming davening. We've been Zooming davening each and every single uh, day um, from when we, almost from when we started to allow members of our shul who are not coming to shul to remain connected and to answer Divrei Kedusha, to answer Kedusha, to answer Kaddish. That the point of the Zoom, which we'll sort of, which we want to just delineate from a halachic perspective, is that there's a distinction made between answering Dvarim Shebek Dusha and to fulfill one's chiv, one's obligation, both for males and females, listening over Zoom. The, if a person is going to listen over Zoom, so there's certainly an ideal of having a Megillah in front of them while while they're listening to the live stream and reading the words of the Megillah alongside the live stream. In the event, and we put this in the guidelines, that none of these possibilities are, 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 are po possible. Um, so then there are minority opinions that do allow for the Zoom. Again, the majority maintain that one does not fulfill their obligation via Zoom, but there, is, there are minority opinions that say one can, and therefore b'sha'as ad-chak, which is to assert ex extenuating circumstances, it's certainly better than doing nothing. And so we will have a Zoom Megillah reading, and we're basically going to be Zooming the same davenings that we always Zoom each and every day. We're certainly not going to shut it off when we get to the Megillah reading. And so that will also, there was an information on that, but that will also be out tomorrow as well. Tomorrow evening, that's Mincha 5.15 will be Zoom. And then we'll have Marv at 6.15 followed by the Megillah. On Friday morning, it will be the Shachris of 7 and 8.30 and the Megillah readings that are included as part of that. I'm not going to read out the meeting ID. You'll have that. It was, it was also sent out as well. So that's how we're going to fulfill Kriyas Megillah uh, here at Shul, both at home as well as in Shul. Um, the other, I, the other mitzvahs of the day that we do in the day of Purim and not the night of Purim is Matanos Le'avyonim. Matanos Le'avyonim is where a person gives at least a gift of, of traditionally we use money. Uh, there is a discussion about using other things, but where money is given to at least poor in the, two poor individuals. Matanos Le'avyonim. It's multiple to multiple. Um, and the idea is, is that a person is giving multiple gifts. He's giving um, one to one ani, another to another ani. This particular mitzvah can be fulfilled prior to Purim, which is why, especially for those people who are not going to be in shul, in shul, we collect on the day. I'll be going around to all the minyanim collecting. We make commitments that get distributed on that particular day, both here and in Israel. Uh, the fulfillment of this mitzvah requires 
not only that one is doing it for Purim, but that the monies are distributed on Purim. And you are allowed to make prior arrangements for that. And so many people have taken advantage of the Matanos de Avionum campaigns, the Sisterhood Matanos de Avionum campaign, as well as we gave an option uh, for people to just donate straight into the shul account. These are wonderful opportunities for people to be engaged in a mitzvah of supporting those who are in need. We are very careful who we give those monies to. We try and find or organizations that have zero overhead and that every money, every penny on the dollar is going towards the needy. And especially this year, where we know the other mitzvah of the day of Purim is Shalach Manos, where a person is presenting to at least one person two foodstuffs that can be of the same bracha. So again, unlike Matanos of Yonim, which is to two people, Shalach Manos is to one, um, two food things, food items to one person. That is the minimum that has to be done. Everyone should try to do so if there are individuals who are in their homes and they haven't left and they're not leaving and they're not comfortable, that is okay. It can be done through an agent. So you, all you have to do is maybe call up someone, a family, a friend member, leave it on the outside of your door, ask them, do you mind just picking it up and bring it to so-and-so? And through that agency, one has fulfilled that mitzvah of, uh, that mitzvah of Purim, especially this year because there's not as much emphasis. Many people are not being involved in Shalach Manos to the degree that they are in a usual year. Many people are using their resources and their expenditures more in terms of the Matanos Le'avyonim. And we certainly have seen that at the shul. An increased amount of people have been giving um, monies towards Matanos Le'avyonim because they're sort of saving from the average year with regards to what they spend on Mishloach Manos. And that Matanos Le'avyonim is a very, very precious, very, very precious thing. The next item that we'll talk about, and this will sort of close out our halachic discussion, um, before I get to some thank yous, and that is the following, in terms of the Suda. So the Suda this year is tricky. You now, usually we go to shul in the afternoon, we dab the mincha, then we have our Suda towards evening, we wash at some point before Shkia, certainly, we have even a lot of the meal before Shkia, and then we take the meal into the nighttime. We can't do that this year, primarily because it's Erev Shabbos. And Erev Shabbos, there's a particular halachos, about not eating late into the day on Friday. These are halachas that pertain to every single Friday in terms of sitting down and engaging in a meal at a particular time late in the afternoon. This restriction also applies to Purim. It's not that the mitzvah of Sudas Purim offsets that halachic consideration. And so ideally, uh, in terms of Sudas Purim, one should ideally begin any time after Megillah in the morning, ideally before Chatzos, which is 12.08. So whereas normally one would one usually does not have uh, their main Suda in the morning, this year one could. One could make their breakfast into the Suda sperm, okay? As long as you must start before 12.08 and complete the meal between two, at 2.56. And the person has close to three o'clock to finish the meal. This will allow, and the whole reason behind this idea is that a person should have an appetite for Shabbos. If a person to go, were to have their meal and go straight into Shabbos, um, that would take away. There is a concept in the Gemara that you might hear people referring to, uh, and that is the concept of having one Purim, one's Purim meal transition into one Shabbos meal. So literally you go from the beginning, Yedava Mincha, start the Suda, go and chant Paris Mapa, and then a person goes into the Shabbos meal. Um, that, is not, that is not recommended. And rather, a person should conclude their meal by 2.56. Another idea that, it, we, men that we mention as the Rabbanim, all the rabbis mention every single year, is that yes, there is a concept of drinking alcohol at the Suda. It's limited to wine and not to hard alcohol, as well as the fee of the obligation can be just drinking a little more wine than one would normally drink at the meal. There is no mitzvah in any level of intoxication. And especially this year, the fact that we're heading into Shabbos, it's very important to Shabbos dominating. It's very important for a person to be able to have the mental mindset 
to be Makabal Shabbos and to daven appropriately uh, for Kabbalah Shabbos and their uh, and their Shabbos and their Shabbos tefillos. So these are the, these are the announcements in terms of the, everything that's going to go on over Purim. I want to make some acknowledgments of thank you. Uh, specifically, I'm going to read out the list of Megillah readers. Now, what you'll notice with the list is when I said that we have 20 readings, both at night and at day, we don't have 20 readers. We have less than 20 readers, which means many of the readers are doing multiple readings over to get us to that 40 mark over both night and day. So we thank Jonathan Altmark. We thank Ma Michael Applebaum, Moshe Dax, Rabbi Glatt, Jason Goldfarb, Noam Greenberg, David Kaslow, Joshua Mitgang, Nachi Penn, Rachmiel, Rabbi Rachmiel Rothberger, uh, Rabbi Andrew Siklik, Eddie Steele, uh, Joel Steinmetz, Jay Weinstein, and Rabbi Wolf. And we really thank them. Some of them are doing multiples outdoors. Uh, just going back to back Megillah leanings is not easy. Doing back to back Megillah leanings in the evening after their fasting is also not something that is done in an easy way. But everyone is really stepping up. And on behalf of the shul, I thank all our Megillah readers for allowing us to be able to put forward something that we never thought would probably be possible, that we would ever think that on a Purim, we would need 40 Megillah readings to be done, but they have stepped forward and volunteered. And really it's, it's, a, great, it's a great effort on their part to help our shul be Makayim, this very, very special, this very, very special mitzvah. I want to thank Rabbi Wolf and Joey Schiff for working on putting the Megillah readings all together. I also want to thank uh, Rabbi Tzin Shachter and Rabbi Shachter for working out the schedule as well in terms of assisting all the different breakdowns and Rabbi Tzin Shachter's amazing work in putting it all on paper. Today you saw the schedule that's going to go out that went out. It's gonna be posted in the shul lobby. So everyone, if they're not sure where they are, they could look at the sign and they could, uh, they could know where they're going. I also want to mention something I forgot to mention is that it's important uh, to make sure that everyone is in the right place. Please bring along a copy of the reservation so that you know where you're going and we know that you're supposed to be at that particular location. We certainly do not want any level of uh, of attendance in a room if one is not registered for that room only because it will jeopardize the safety of, of, of the shul individuals, of our shul members. I know just shortly, it's already been a half an hour and I just wanna share a brief thought. And I think, and it speaks to, I think, not only truth of matters, not only to Purim and the idea of what we're trying to accomplish here at the Young Gazelle, uh, of Woodmere with regards to our Purim celebration, but, but much more than that. Um, it speaks to really how our shul has handled, and I'll touch upon it a little later, has, has handled itself throughout this entire pandemic. And I'll start with the following question. You know, one of the famous questions that's asked with regards to, to looking at and distinguishing between Hanukkah and Purim, so we know that Chazal gave us a mode of how we're supposed to commemorate these days, how we're supposed to celebrate these days. What's our, what's our thought process? What do we do to celebrate the fact that we've had these great miracles? Right? We say the bracha, shasa nisim by both. We say ala nisim by both. So what is, what, is the, what is the difference and distinction? So we saw that by Hanukkah, it's halal and hodah. It's halal and hodah, it's acknowledgement, it's praise and thanks to God for the fact that we had all those particular miracles and we experienced them and this, we experienced the salvation. By Purim though, it's not Hallel and Hodah. It's called, we call it Mishteh V'Simcha. We have, we're festive. We eat meat. We drink wine. We're engaged in very physical activities. The spiritual Hallel and Hodah of Hanukkah, although yes, we say that the Megillah is in lieu of the Hallel, but nonetheless, we don't find Mishta Simcha by Hanukkah, and we don't find Halal and Hodah as being the primary expression of Purim. It's rather Mishta Simcha. It's very physical, drinking, eating. And what's the reason behind this distinction? So they, what's often spoken about is that 
the distinction is based on what the Xera, what was the decree that the Jewish people faced? This is a famous idea, and I'll just say it briefly because I want to get to a different point. What was the Xera? What was the decree? So we say, you know what? In Hallel, in, in Hanukkah, there was no plan of destruction in Hanukkah of the physical aspects of the Jewish people. There was no final solution in place. There was no question that we were going to survive physically as long as we submitted to the Greeks spiritually. Hanukkah was attacked on the spiritual value system of the Jewish people. That was the Xera. We talk about Purim. What was the Xera Purim? La Shmid, La Rog, La Bed, to destroy, to eradicate everybody. Nah, everyone, old, young, all the Yudim, all the Jews would be destroyed. A complete and final solution was planned and strategized by Haman against the Jewish people. Two very different Xeros. Hanukkah, a Xera on the spiritual plane. Purim, a decree on the physical plane. And so the answer that's given is namely the fact that they were addressing the celebration addresses what the Xera was, what the decree was. Spiritual decree in Hanukkah, spiritual celebration of what? Halal and Hoda. When we get into the Purim story, with its Xera being a physical Xera of killing out all the Jews. So our bodies were at stake. They were on the line. Therefore, when we celebrate the salvation, we celebrate it through a physical expression of Mishta Vesimcha. It's not just a, a physical idea of feasting, of just having a, a, a grand old time in a physical way. We're elevating eating, but it's specifically through eating, through something, a physical activity, that we're expressing our celebration of the Chag by virtue of the fact that the Xera was on us in a physical way. Comes along the Bach in Hilchas Hanukkah, when he contrasts Purim and Hanukkah, and he takes it a step forward. And he says is you have to not only realize that the celebration is based on the Xera, but you also have to see that the celebration was and the Xera were based on what we call the Seba. What is the cause? And you'll think, what are the causes? I mean, the causes. The causes by Hanukkah, you had the wicked king, the, the Greeks, the Yavanim, and they had their plan. They wanted us to assimilate. They wanted us to acculturate. We were keeping our own things. And therefore, it was a clash of civilizations. It was a clash of Greek, Greco civilization with a Jewish monotheistic, religious based, believing in God, not a belief in a system of, uh, you know, mythical gods. That was the, that that was the conflict. But we also really have to realize that we talk about the concept of a Seba, that the enemies don't necessarily, don't just come upon the Jewish people for no reason. There sometimes is a cause within the Jewish people. And then because of that, the Xera, the decree, is a, is a follow-up. God brings upon the Xera by virtue of the fact that there was some failure of the Jewish people. And it's the failure of the Jewish people that really goes at the heart of informing both the Xera and the celebration. So, for example, with regards to Hanukkah, they talk about there was a Hesrashlis Ba'avoda. They, at the time prior to the onset of the conflict with the Greeks, we had a Beis Migdash, we had Kohanim, we had the service, we had everything, but something was missing. Our determination and our steadfastness in appreciation and our, our, our strength in doing the avoda and doing the service of God have become weakened. And as a result, we opened the door for the Xera to come about. And then we needed a celebration. So the, when we talk about the Hanukkah story, the failure of Klal Yisrael was in the area of spirituality. They weren't performing the avoda on the level that they should have. As a result, they get exera. The exera is what? The exera is to nullify the avoda of the Beis Hamikdash. To comes along the Greeks and they defile all the oils. They'll take it, take a decree that removes our possibility from doing the avoda. And so, when we have the commemoration and the celebration, 
we celebrate in a spiritual way because both the Siba, the cause, the Xera, the decree, and the celebration are all oriented in Hanukkah on the spiritual domain. When we talk about Purim, so we mentioned the Xera was physical, the celebration was physical. So what was it about the Siba? So what the Sechazal tell us, different Svarim make comment on it, is that it was over the fact that there was a great level of divisiveness amongst the Jewish people. There was what we call a period. Haman goes before Achashverosh, and in laying the claim to try and put forward this idea of destroying the Jews, he says, Yesh am echad mefuzar u mefurad bein amen. They're scattered and they're separated. The Kliyaka brings down that it's not just telling us that the Jews were demographically spread out over these 127 nations. That wasn't just it. There was a period, there was a level of separation within the Jews. There were these people and those people and this, and, and we were so diffracted and so separated. So Esther understood this, that this was the failure. What does Esther do when she realizes the failure? She realizes that the antidote is to bring the Jews together. The way to do this, and the way, if we have a Xera, if we have a Seba, meaning that the cause that brings about the Xera is the fact that the Jewish people have machlokes, there's no unity, there's no achtas. And that lays the seeds for a Xera decree that comes upon the Jewish people, which is to utterly obliterate them physically. So Esther understands this. She's a wise person. And she tells Mordechai, Lech kinos es kol Go and gather everyone together. Gather them together. Bring them together. Have a level of achtos. And it's that shuva that Esther brings about that ultimately leads to a situation that there is a Yeshua. And with that Yeshua comes Klal Yisrael, come Mordechai the Esther, thinking about how are the Jewish people, how are Klal Yisrael going to commemorate this each year? So they pick it to do it in a spiritual way. Because in doing it in a spiritual way, it's a reflection of the fact that the Xer was physical because the Seba was physical. There was a physical, there was all this fighting that was going on amongst Kal Yisrael. And therefore that had to be undone. There needed to be a tshuva. And that tshuva was actually accomplished. A wild thing is that Kal Yisrael actually came together. As so often the case, sometimes in the most difficult moments, that's when the Jewish people do break down the barriers that separate them and come together in, as in a symbol in a symbol of achdus. My son once showed me actually a sefer that he has, the Ikve Abirim. The Ikve Abirim asks a very good question. He says, "We know that on Purim we say a bracha on the night of Purim. We say the bracha of Aravas Rivenu, Adanas Dinenu, Panokemus Nikmasenu. We say the bracha Aravas Rivenu that God has fought." our fights, Hadanas Dinenu, he has adjudicated, he has judged our judgments, Hanokem Esnik Masenu, and he has taken revenge, right? Hanokem Esnik Masenu, our revenge. It's very unique that he makes the distinction that by Hanukkah, what do we say in our al prayer, right? What do we say in the al prayer? We say, Rafta Es Rivam, Danta es dinam, nekamta es nekmasam. Same phrases. Rafta es rivam, danta es dinam, nekamta es nekmasam. We talk about God fighting our fights. We talk about Hashem judging our judgments. We talk about the Rabbanu Shalom taking our revenge. But there's a big difference. When it comes to Hanukkah, it's rafta es rivam, rafta, danta, nekamta. It's all in the singular. God did it, Rafta, as Rivam, Danta as Dinam, Nakanta as Nikmasam, when it comes, when it says Harav as Rivenu, Hadan as Dinenu, Nakanta as Nikmasenu, it's all in the individual. It's specifically Rafta as Rivam, Danta as Dinam, Nakanta as Nikmasam, is Belashon Soda Nister. It's not ours, it's theirs. By Purim, we say Rafta as Rivenu, Danta as Dinenu, it's, it's ours. We're not talking about theirs. Rafta is Rivam, Danta is Dinam. It's, it's like we're, we're declaring it, but it's about what God did for them, not for us. Why is there that distinction? Why is it by Hanukkah, it's them, not us? Whereas by Purim, it's Rivenu, it's ours. It's everyone in the collective. It's a, Lushan, a direct language applying to all of us. 
And so he answers that beautiful answer in that that, that was the difference, specifically hiding, highlighting what was accomplished on Purim. What was accomplished on Purim is Raftas Rivenu, who we were all in. All of Kal Yisrael, all the Jewish people were involved. Kinosas Kola Yegudim, Kimu Vikiblu. It was a plurality of the Jewish people coming together. And I think if there's a message that I want to share with the shul, it's that not only this Purim, with everything that we've done, not only with leading up to our planning, not all the things. We don't, some people appreciate it. Some things we're not even aware. A few weeks ago, we sent out an email asking both for volunteers, as well as for people who have not, have, have, who have had difficulty obtaining the vaccine. Jan Wernick and her Chesed committee and Rabbi Schachter have spent hours and many, many individuals, tens of individuals, hundreds have been saved through their help and their emailing links, but direct involvement in over 50, 60, 70 individuals in assisting them in getting the help that they need. Our shul, Rabbi Glatt, Rabbi Wolf, myself, Rabbi Schachter, our team, our lay leadership of our president, Shmuel Wagner, Josh Coulter and Ari Shulman, our, our co-chairman of the board and the entire board and the entire shul. It's, it's, a, it's not just the leaders. It's our entire shul reflects that particular value that is expressed in our Purim, Haravas Rivenu. It's ours. And tomorrow night, and this is the challenge before us, and I know I'm only speaking to 74 people, and it's going to be a challenge tomorrow night for 1,250 people. Do I go to the minion that I register for? Do I enter the door that I want to enter in? If we are going to achieve this, and make sure that this Purim for our shul is a Kiddush Hashem, where we have 40 Megillah readings, read by people who are reading multiple times even after fasting, it's incumbent upon all of us to do what we need to do to ensure that we celebrate Purim, and to celebrate Purim as a shul, and to also be continuously, as we're doing, reaching out to everyone in our shul, both at home and those who are coming to shul, those who are still davening in yards, we are all members of this precious kehila, lech kinos as kol yehudim. Go out and gather the Jewish people together. This year, it's going to be done in a very safe way. And I want to wish everyone a chag purim sameach. Everyone should have a safe purim, a joyous purim. Very different, very different than purims that we've had in the past. But one nonetheless, Baruch Hashem, there's what to be thankful. Many of our shul member families, uh, the adults have been vaccinated. There's hope and there's promise. And we hope to see everyone back in shul, Mitz Hashem, to celebrate it together, to continue celebrating Shabbos and Yantav together very, very soon. So I wish everyone a good evening. So good to see the faces. And Mitz Hashem, we will see you all return to shul in the near distant future. Chag Purim Sameach. Thank you, Rabbi.